Like I worked with Matthew McConaughey and Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt. I managed these events. I was their escort. I was making sure that they were getting the interviews that they needed. As an unpaid intern, like doing that and handling that caliber of clientele is insane. My favorite moment was I was backstage. I smelled something. I was like, what is that? And I look over and Brad Pitt, John Berman, and Logan are all just sitting in a circle, just smoking a joint. And I was just like, that, this is crazy. I moved out to LA and I'm watching Brad Pitt smoke. Yeah. The, new, the, new the, new school. School. the new school. This is The New School with your host, Christine Hong. Welcome to a new kind of school where we talk about career paths you don't normally get to hear about in the classroom. Every episode, I talk to someone with an interesting life path and learn about how they got to where they are today. Hey everyone, it's Christine here. Before we start the show, I wanna see how you're doing. I felt super tired the past week and I honestly thought I was getting sick until I realized I was experiencing what can only be described as an emotional hangover. After talking with the rest of the team here at the new school, we realized we were all feeling the same way. So as you may have noticed, we held back our regular scheduled content and promotion the past week to focus on the Black Lives Matter movement and show our stand against institutional racism. You can find resources on how to support the Black Lives Matter movement in our bio on our Instagram account at the New School Podcast and our website, thenewschoolpodcast.com slash Black Lives Matter. There is one quote I read last week that I'd really like to share regarding this current time. Sometimes opening your eyes to what's really going on in the world can be the most painful thing you ever have to do. Don't get depressed about it. Just be grateful that you're now awake and use it to drive the goodness out of you to change the world. Just a reminder that a revolution has many lanes and even if you're contributing in a small way, whether it's posting on social media, protesting on the streets, donating silently, educating yourself, or even just having tough conversations with friends and family, just know that this has an impact on making things better in this country. So be kind to yourself. Don't ever give up and just keep moving forward because we can all do this together and we can make a change in this country. All right, next, let's get on with the show. Today, we're talking about a field I've always been interested in, PR. If you've been Sex in the City like me, you've probably been obsessed with Samantha Jones and her job, public relations executive. I mean, is it really as glam as a show? And do you really get to go to exclusive parties all the time and work with celebrity clients daily? Today, I'm going to get the answers by sitting down with Emily Johnson, an experienced publicist in the media landscape. She got her start by interning with the woman who was Miramax's Oscar whisperer, predicting which films would make it big at the Oscars, and has worked with huge clients like Netflix, Prime Video, Fatburger, Waldorf Astoria, Hilton, and Marriott International. In this episode, we chat about what PR is really like, how to get into PR, and what the different levels of the PR career ladder look like. And just a warning for those who have kids at home, there is some salty language in this episode, so if you're looking for a clean version, please check out the newschoolpodcast.com slash episode. So, as you know, mm -hmm. I'm obsessed with Sex in the City. Samantha Jones, PR, like, she seems like she's the coolest shop, right? Like, yeah. on the show, she's always getting into the coolest parties, and, like, she's like, oh, this hot restaurant open, or this club, so they get, like, early access, mm -hmm. and she gets to work with, like, Lucy Liu and, like, other, like, celebs, mm -hmm. and I was like, that seems like a cool life, like, being all these cool people. I asked you, I was like, it's not really like that, right? Yeah. And you're like, no, it is. <laughs> yeah, no, it is. It definitely is. <laughs> yeah, I was like, okay, I need to know, like, New York actually is. Yeah, it definitely is like that. Yeah. It is. I'm also, like, very curious about, like, building brands. Like, you know how she, like, took that model? Mm -hmm. No, not model. The, he was a waiter, Smith yeah. Jared. Yeah. And she made him the biggest actor of all time. So I'm always curious, like, is it seriously it's just one brand. PR person mm -hmm. who, like, makes someone's entire career? Like, could she turn me <laughs> into that? Into that, yeah. I'm so curious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a very fascinating field. I think, mm -hmm. you know, they definitely glamorize it, mm -hmm. but they do a good job of highlighting the fact that that is a lot of what PR is. Like, you are building a brand, whether it's a person or an actual company's brand. Mm -hmm. You're contributing to it in a lot of ways, and you're, you know, c coming up with creative story angles and pushing that out to the media to basically build a company and bring them, bring their background and their story to the masses via a news article in GQ or a feature story in Forbes or even the Wall Street Journal. 
So it definitely is like a huge part of it. And, you know, depending on which industry you're in, like, for example, like at one point I was doing hospitality PR and I was, you know, in the know of all the hot new restaurant openings in LA. So I would go to those and be among the first to try a new restaurant. Sometimes we'd be sending them on as clients. So I'd try them then. Or, you know, we would be doing like an after party for a film that we were doing a film campaign for. That was like back in my first job. So it definitely can be like that. <laughs> it's fun. But you do have to limit the drinking on the job sometimes. Every yeah. now and then. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Cool. Drinking's encouraged. I'm yeah, drink, <laughs> drinking's encouraged sometimes. Mostly towards the end of the night, around midnight. <laughs> yeah, like get the client loose. Too. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them loosey-goosey, you know? Yeah, so you've done yeah. both people and company PR? Yeah, so brand PR and then film PR. So not so much people, but more so movies. And then the people yeah. kind of came along with it. We were hired for the movie itself, but we worked in tandem with the personal publicists. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was kind of a collective effort on that end. Would you ever want to be a personal publicist? Fuck no. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Never in a million years. I know people that do that. I've seen them deteriorate slowly with their personal life, their alcoholics, or they just don't work out and they're just not happy with themselves. And it's just like, that's just not me. Uh, that's not everybody, okay. but that's like the extreme. Because their life revolves around one person. Around one person and they don't have time for themselves. That's what I think the thing about Sex and City doesn't get. It doesn't see the fact that Samantha Jones, she's so good at her job, but to be that good, sometimes you have to make so many sacrifices with your personal life, and it doesn't really do a good job of showing that. No, her life seems great. Her, her yeah. life seems perfect, but yeah. it's not, getting to where she is is not as glamorous. Okay, so you said there's personal PR, mm-hmm. um, brand, and what's the third one? Personal, brand, and then there's film PR, and then there's also, or film and TV PR, basically. Mm-hmm. Those are kind of like the three main buckets that I've noticed out here in Los Angeles. And then I guess under the brand bucket, that can be anything from like representing food and beverage PR in in terms of like consumer packaged goods, CPG product. And then there's restaurants, travel and hospitality. There's so much Mm -hmm. underneath the major brand umbrella. It can be broken down. But I feel like brand kind of operates when you look tactically what you do day to day, it kind of operates the same for brands for the most part. Entertainment, and that's that's kind of like doing like personal PR. For personal PR, it's completely different. You're not, you know, coming out with different pitch angles. You're publicizing a person and you're building a person's personal brand. And that is, compl- I am not familiar with a lot of that, but that you're basically someone's personal assistant, just from what I've seen. And you're making sure that they are on the cover of magazines and they're in, they're getting photographed out at parties. They're getting photographed on the red carpet. You're making sure that they're constantly relevant. Sometimes it is putting them in fake relationships. Sometimes it's just like hiding the fact that they're gay, which is awful. But sometimes some people want to do that. And that's what their publicist does. I used to work at Tinder and there was PR and marketing mm-hmm. and I mm-hmm. still like don't really get the difference yeah. between a job sometimes. Okay. And then you work at a PR agency. Mm-hmm. So what's the difference between these things? So your team is in-house PR. In-house PR teams and marketing teams are tasked with building the brand of the company that they're actually working for, obviously. Like whether it's through getting interviews for the CEO or even like creating a whole PR communications plan, whether it's like your business development officer talking about what the dating trends are around the holiday season. Like, it's cuffing season. Or, like, most fashionable women in tech, but it's really just, like, the it's company's really PR company's person. company's PR person getting them these articles, which happens a lot. Same so, with those awards, I'm guessing, too. Yeah, same with awards. That's usually the PR team and marketing team. They're more focused on making true money, honestly. It's, like, they're focused on, or I guess for Tinder specifically, it's, like, how are we going to market our product to the masses and to consumers so that they'll download that or that they'll yeah or even then it's like buying ads like people buying ads for the app that's all part of marketing it's more focused on how can we get sales or get downloads of this product that we have right. but for pr it's not as cut and dry because pr is earned media there's no way of really quantifying it because you can't tell how many sales result from the article that you you know, pitch and that you secure in the New York Times. Yeah, how do you judge performance? Based off the number of placements. That's how a lot of agencies do it. So it's like if we're booking 
and getting our client and pop sugar and bustle and wall street journal then that's good for them Mm -hmm. or they might care about these like dinky local publications instead for example i represent an art gallery right now Mm -hmm. and all they care about is being in malibu publications because they're based in malibu and they know that malibu residents are reading these malibu magazines and if they read about it that they'll come in and they'll buy artwork Mm -hmm. that's the goal so just because they get featured in New York Times does not mean that that's going to be a good thing for their business. Like, it might just not even affect. You have to be specific and understand, like, the client's needs. And that's kind of, like, basically the gist of PR and earned media. How did your interest in PR start? Like, when did you know you wanted to do it? So, first of all, I went to school. I wanted to be a journalist. And I realized that there was not a lot of money in journalism. So... I decided that PR was a profitable thing. At the time, I, you know, was pop culture obsessed. And I was like, oh my God, like I always heard, you know, Hills was a huge thing. Kelly Catrone, Kelly Catrone, you know, like (laughs) Kelly Catrone was like the badass publicist in the Hills. And like, I (laughs) wanted to work. I was like, oh my God, I want to be like her, even though she's such such a bitch. But like, (laughs) I was drawn to it. I was like, oh my God, I want to be in entertainment PR. I think this is so cool. And then fast forward to my junior year of college, my second semester, I chose to study abroad in France. I was in Cannes and my program had a connection with the festival, the Cannes Film Festival. So I was able to get a few internships during my time abroad. And in that, I worked for this celebrity gifting lounge doing, you know, basically just doing grunt work, like setting up and then, you know, being the face where I would just lead this talent through the gifting lounge and made sure they got everything. And then that was for the first week of the festival. And then the second week of the festival, I was helping with the AMFAR Cinema Against AIDS Gala that raised money for AIDS research. And in that, I was coordinating one of the fashion shows, sending out invitations, working with media to make sure they got all the interviews they needed, make sure they were at their seats, all that stuff. So I was able to do a little bit of PR on that. And I really liked it. I loved being around the lights and the red carpet, and I just found it really cool. You know, that was kind of like my realization. I was like, this is what I should be doing. I should move to Los Angeles and make this happen. After I got back my junior year, it was my senior year. And then I was like trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was toggling between law school and just saying fuck it and moving out to L.A. And so I said fuck it. And I moved out to L.A. because I didn't want to pay the student loans (laughs) for law school. Yeah, and that was it. So that's kind of like how I realized I wanted to go into PR and then Once I got to L.A., it was a whole other story. It was quite the struggle. It was hard because I, even though I had the internship, I was from South Carolina. I didn't know anyone. I was a transplant like everybody else. And I had made a name for myself. And so I got my internship with the film publicity agency, the Oscar Whisperer. I got that through a girl that was a year younger than me at school. And she's like, yeah, they always need interns. Like, they would love to have you. She interned at the time, and I got the internship right after and did that when I moved out here. I also worked at Mendocino Farms and nannied. lucky break, though. Yeah, so I got lucky with that, and that was my end. And it was a struggle. It was really hard. At times, I really wanted to give up and move away because it was like I wasn't making any money. And Mm. LA's expensive. LA's hard. I was making minimum wage. I wasn't even getting paid at the internship. Mm. I was making minimum wage at Mendocino Farms. My All my money was coming from tips. And then I was living off savings. That I, I saved up $10,000. Mm-hmm. And then I was nannying. So I had no life. So I worked 90 hours a week. Oh like, God. it was crazy. What do you mean by Oscar Whisperer, by the way? So Oscar Whisperer. So there's this super exclusive sect of people in the entertainment industry called the Oscar Whisperers. And Ooh. I'm not sure how many of them are there are. I think there's about between five and seven of these women. That's it. That's it. They're all women. They're all women. And so badass women, like <laughs> I think there's like maybe one man, but most of them are women and they're just they know everyone. They all look alike. They're all like Jewish women with black <laughs> hair. Like, but they all have like similar personalities. They just they're go-getters. They know everyone. They're charismatic. 
They're amazing. They're strong. They're powerful. They know Diane Dargan, who has been a member of the Academy for 50 years. Like, they're best friends with the Academy members. They're best friends with SAG. They're best friends with the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. Like, they know all these people, and they are the ones that are responsible for building these movies that you see at these award shows and creating them to be the Oscar-winning movie of the year. So they're hired by film companies. Film companies and producers are who hire them. Wow. I don't it's, wonder how to get that. How do you become an Oscar winner? I know. It's like, you, I don't know. It's like you have to know these people. You have to know everyone. Yeah. And you get to that point just by working for these these women. It's pretty fascinating. It's cool. Okay, so how did you start getting paid to be in PR? This was like eight months in. I was like, I can't keep fucking working for free. I got to make money because I started running out of savings. So while you had this unpaid internship with the Oscar Whisperer, yeah. she couldn't like convert you to paid or help you get a paid internship? Mm-hmm. What's the point of working for her? The clout. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just like, you know, the experience. It really did help shape me. I continued working for her because she would pay you to work for events and I would continue doing that on the side as I moved on. But... I just didn't want to work for her full time because it was kind of a toxic environment. Mm -hmm. And I learned that that, for me, was not what I wanted at the time. And it didn't serve me. I don't know. It was crazy. So long story short, I was like, how the fuck? Like, what am I doing with my life? Why am I here? And then I got a call from Connect Agency, which was the agency that I was at for three years and loved. And it really shaped me in my career. They called me and they hired me on as a paid intern. And then I moved up from paid intern to assistant to coordinator to account executive pretty fast. Oh, wow. So, yeah, I guess that internship experience helped you get the paid one. It did. It did. It helped me get the paid one. It really thickened my skin. But it also helped me, like, discover things. And I had a lot of really cool experiences. Like, I worked with Matthew McConaughey. And I worked with Jennifer Aniston. And I worked with Brad Pitt. Like, it was... Wait, what? Like, yeah, like, I did, like, events with them. And I managed these events. I was their escort. I was making sure that they were getting the interviews that they needed. I was... You know what I mean? As an unpaid intern, like, doing that and handling that caliber of clientele is oh, insane. Oh. My favorite moment was I was backstage waiting for Brad Pitt, Logan Lerman, Michael Pena, and John Berman. We were all backstage, and, you know, the talent was congregating. I smelled something. I was like, what is that? And I look over, and Brad Pitt, John Berman, and Logan are all just sitting in a circle just smoking a joint. (laughs) And I was just like, that? This is crazy. I moved out to L.A., and I'm watching Brad Pitt smoke. (laughs) Okay. What's your day-to-day like? You Right now, you work for an agency? So I work for an agency, and I represent just a handful of consumer products, one of my clients is a stem cell skincare brand mm-hmm. that's brand new. It just launched. It's called Miage. My other client is a sustainable water brand. They are one of the first companies to do a negative plastic bottle, meaning they take their plastic bottles are made out of plastic from the ocean. So they're one of the first companies to do that. Um, and then my other client that's pretty big is they're a financial wealth management company in Los Angeles. So it's an interesting random mix of people. Oh, and an art gallery. So a good range of things that keeps me on my toes, just different ways of thinking when it comes to pitching. But so because I have such a range of clients, I usually map my week out on a Sunday and I figure out which clients I'm going to be pitching on which day. And so when I come in, I usually just look at my emails, make sure no one's gotten back to me on interest in writing an article off of an email that I sent the previous week. I read the news because being in PR, it's like sometimes trending news stories can result in a new pitch angle or something that might connect to my client that I can reach out to media for. So a good example of this is, say one of my clients was a brand of freeze-dried fruit or something crazy like that. And For whatever reason, there was, like, a recall on this other brand, like, our competitor's brand. Sometimes a lot of journalists will be looking to 
competitor brands to comment on that recall and talk about the safety of the product. Mm, okay. And so that's when we step in and we're like, okay, this is an opportunity for us to be in the news and talk about how our safety practices are better than our competitors, which is kind of dirty, but that's how it works sometimes, you know? And that's just yeah. one example. So we have to know like what's going on in the world around us because had I not read the news, I wouldn't have known that that recall happened. You have to be in the know of what's going on in each of your clients' industries. So I always read the news in each of my clients' industries. So it's just so I can know what's going on. Also, it's like that's... timeliness of like, it's tax season. So like my financial wealth management company, like there's the two women who own the business. Like I always pitch them. So this is the perfect time for them to comment on how you can be saving or how you can make the most out of your taxes or how you can get the most out of your tax return. So Smart. AP and US World yeah. News Report, they're always looking for commentary on that. So I pitch them and they are usually in it. They work for you? They're yeah, my clients. AP. Yeah. Well, AP, I just, I pitch them. So I email a journalist that I know mm. is writing about the topic. Yeah. And I say, hey, I have these two experts on this topic and I would love for you to write about it. So that's kind of like how that's we get so our clients smart. and things is we notice the trends and we cold email these writers who might have not ever heard of us before. But that's pretty much the gist of how we get my day to day of getting my clients in the news and keeping them relevant and generating awareness for their brand and their company and their services. So basically, like, there's a database called mm. Cision, and it has most staff journalists' emails on it of every publication in the U.S. that you can possibly imagine. Like, from big, big, big to small to, like, random ass, like, trade. They have every staff writer's email. So a lot of times when you're researching and you're, you have a pitch angle in mind that you want or news from your client that you want to share, you're like, okay— like, let me go on this website or let me go to this outlet that I know my client wants to be in and see who writes about this angle that I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. typically. Like, what's their beat? Like, what's this, like, if this journalist is always writing about skincare, I'm obviously going to pitch them my skincare product, Miage, because they'd be interested in this. Like, they want to yeah. know, like, this is hot new technology. It's amazing. It's innovative what this company is doing. And a lot of people haven't done it before. So they'll probably want to know and be interested in the science behind it because they write about you know, all these other anti-aging products that are on the market. So I reach out to that person at Vogue. I'm like, okay, this woman, Sarah, she always is writing about beauty. Let me look up her email. Uh, so I go on Cision and I tip, usually they'll have their emails, Cision will. If they don't, if they're a freelancer, sometimes I have to get really stalkery and I have <laughs> to like go on there. If they're a freelance and they're not on staff, like they, sometimes a lot of those freelancers have Twitter pages and then they have their website listed on their Twitter. And then on their website, you can their email is usually hidden. And I can just, like, find their personal email. I always take time to really research and read everything that the writer has written. And I find something that the writer has written that I personally find interesting. And I always compliment them on their writing and what they've written about. So that's, like, a good way of, like, weaseling my way in and creating a relationship. Because at the end of the day, if you work for, like, Today Show or if you work for Wall Street Journal, you're getting a 1,000 emails like before noon oh my god from PR people okay. because I think the statistic I can't remember the exact numbers but I think it's like one journalist for every 10 publicists so it's like it's like how do you stand out how do you, exactly what you stand out doing is you personally pitch you make a connection with them because I know for myself if I were to get an email from someone who was like complimenting me on my career path mm -hmm. or something, like, I would be more inclined to respond to them than someone who just is sending me, like, a canned email that you can tell isn't unique to me, that is just copy-paste, there's yeah. typos, they got my name wrong. Like, you know, journalists get turned off by that. Like, they want to read something that's personal. And that's why when I pitch, I make it personal. And I find more success when I do that. I'll give you a good example. I once took an hour and a half to write one pitch. Wow. And it was to a Forbes writer. His name was right. Noah Kirsch. And to this day, I would say it was the crowning moment in my career. But it was definitely like the crowning, like, I want to frame the pitch that I wrote because it was so good. Wow. I was like, dude, like, this story that you wrote about the, you know, family video store was so cool. It's amazing. Like, I can't believe, like, this guy, like, is still running this popular, like, movie rental business in the Midwest because no one fucking gives a shit about, like, DVDs anymore. But in the Midwest, 
like a lot of people don't want to pay for streaming services. So mm -hmm. they'll still go to it. Like I just found it really fascinating. Like I tied it back to the fact that he writes a lot about chain businesses. Mm -hmm. And one of my clients at the time was Sky Zone Trampoline Park. And the CEO, Jeff, like he basically grew the business when he was 21 after his mom died of breast cancer. His dad started the business but had to leave to take care of his mom. So Jeff continued it on and it became the fastest growing franchise pretty immediately. And he invented basically the trampoline park industry. And wow. that was my hook. And Noah responded within five minutes. Wow. And Jeff Platt and Sky Zone were in print in Forbes magazine. Like Noah flew out to interview Jeff. It was a whole Amazing. thing. It was so cool. And I owe it to the hour and a half that it took me to write that fucking pitch. <laughs> Do you ever get to use the relationships you have with journalists and you're like, hey man, we're like friends. Always. Like, call me. <laughs> always. Always. So when he actually came out to LA, like at the time I was living in Austin for work because mm. I helped open the agency at the time. I was working out of our Austin office. And I couldn't be there for the in-person interview that he was doing with Jeff at the time, the CEO of Sky Zone. And so I gave him all these tips on, like, where he needs to go to L.A. Because he's such a foodie. So I mm -hmm. gave him all the good spots to go. And he was so complimentary of me. And now I can just email him and being like, be like, hey, this is my client. Like, is this a fit for anything you're working on? Or is this a fit for anyone on the oh, Forbes nice. staff? And he always gives me good intel, which half the time it's like that's all PR people want is, like, they just want to know, like, is this a fit for anybody on your team? Let me know. That's all we care about. We just want an answer. Like, are we wasting our time pitching this angle? Like, give me your feedback. And a lot of times, because I took the time to develop that relationship with some of these writers, it goes over pretty well. And nice. they give me that feedback that I want, so then I can be better at my job. So besides, like, writing emails, what else are you doing during the day? <laughs> <laughs> Writing emails, no. <laughs> uh, making phone calls, strategizing. It's a lot of strategy. My managing director, she's so great, Jessica. She and I brainstorm a lot. Like, we like to talk for ad nauseum for, like, 30, 45 minutes about different pitch angles that we can think of for our clients. Like, if something's not working, like, we're always strategizing about, like, what's next? What can we do to keep our client top of mind mm -hmm. with media? Like, what's interesting? What's happening? Um, so I do that. And then... Some other times it's, you know, client calls. Sometimes it's putting out fires. So if, like, my client is facing a crisis, I have to sometimes, like, draft last-minute quotes. That rarely happens, but it does happen. But I will say most of my day is emailing people. But it's, like, very, like, beautiful It's emails. a beautiful, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's beautiful emails. It's it like really is. Art. A lot of people think that PR is easy, but it's not. Like, we had clients once that said that their wife who sits at home all day, could do this job. Wow. And I'm like, mm, oh my, I'd like to see her try. Why are no you experience. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's pretty crazy. But for the most part, clients respect it. But it's tough. How much do companies usually pay the PR firms? It varies. The bigger the company, the higher the retainer. But sometimes companies are super fucking cheap. It's like, okay, you can pay us more than that. On average, it depends on the agency, but minimum is typically 7000 a month. Okay. But if it's a bigger company, so when I represented Fat Burger and when they went public and they had multiple restaurant companies underneath their Fat Brands umbrella, they were paying us twenty thousand a month for PR wow. services. So where the commission comes in is if I identify a client, I say this is the client I want to work with, so I reach out to them, I email them, I sign them for new business, and I basically bring them into our agency, and then I would get commission from their monthly retainer. Usually it's like 10% commission. Another part of my day-to-day -day is uh, identifying new business opportunities. So that's pretty fun. How do you woo a client? That's new to me. That's a new realm, but that is something that I personally like. feel like for me to grow as a person, like right now I'm mid-level, but for me to get to that next level, I need to be good at bringing in money to my company so they can see me. Not that they don't see me as a valuable asset, because I am, but this is going to help them make more money and help us make more money so that way that we can be, be a viable PR agency. And bringing in new clients means that we're building our agency resume for our other potential brands to work with and really growing ourselves in that way. Yeah. What's your favorite and least favorite thing about the job? So my favorite thing would be the fact that I get to talk to people, all kinds of people, and I'm such a nerd. I love really diving into 
different industries that I might not be familiar with. Even though my job is PR, I could hands down say, like when I was representing Sky Zone Trampoline Park and Fat Burger, I was an expert in trampoline park industry and an expert in the burger industry. Like you really get down to like the nitty gritty of like your client's world. And yeah. that is like my favorite thing because I become an expert in not just PR, but also just these multiple industries. And like I'm familiar with like one of my clients at one point was a plastic surgeon. Like I know way too much about Botox and toxins and fillers. You know what I mean? It's just like I know way too much. I don't want to know this, but I know it. And it's kind of fun for me because I get to nerd out on a topic. It's like being an investor. You exactly. Learn about so many things. You learn about yeah. a lot of different things, and that's what yeah. I love about it. The thing that I don't like is the stress that it can bring. It can bring a lot of stress, and it's a lot of unnecessary stress. And it's a lot of stress that publicists bring on themselves. I think we're perfectionists, and we care too much about what our clients think when we shouldn't. And I think our industry is so hard to separate ourselves from what our clients are thinking about us, and it kills a lot of people, and it burns a lot of people out because they're just constantly trying to please. Why do you think it's like that so much for the PR industry? I think it's mostly with PR because the client is relying on you to be the brand voice and to make their brand relevant to the masses. And if you can't do that or if they're not thinking that they're, you know, in the news enough or whatever, it's just you're done. You're going to get fired. And there goes the money because they're paying us for a service. And if we can't provide for them, you can't make someone write about your client. Yeah. It's like, sorry, like, at the end of the day, like, no one gives a shit. You have to learn to accept that. And I think a lot of people have a trouble learning to accept that that's okay for someone to fire you. Yeah. But you also have to remember that they're probably firing you nine times out of ten because you're not getting press, but it's because their product is not pressworthy at all. Do you ever not accept a client because they're not worth promoting? A lot of times it's not up to me. It's up to my boss. Mm. And they've signed a client because they wanted the money. And I was like, this is a cafeteria. Why are we going to represent this restaurant that is shit? And it was not PRable. You can't fix something that's broken. Like, they had to figure that out themselves. It's like PR can only do so much. Yeah. You mentioned, like, earlier, that's my boss's job, not me to pick the PR clients. So mm -hmm. I was wondering what's... The different roles usually at PR firm? Is it standardized? And like, how do the responsibilities and day-to-day -day differ? Yeah. So it varies from agency to agency. But for the most part, most agencies start an intern or assistant, except interns unpaid and assistant is paid. So it goes assistant, coordinator, or junior account executive, either one. Then it goes account executive. Then it goes senior account executive, which is what I am. Then it goes supervisor. Sometimes it might just go straight to manager instead of supervisor, but it, it varies. Then above supervisor is manager. If you have a supervisor, you have a manager above that. And then after manager, it ranges, but usually it's managing director, and then it's VP, and then it's CEO. Typically, that's the pecking order. And then roles, assistants usually doing just like, they're not really doing a lot of outreach yet. They're mostly doing kind of admin work. They're doing research for you. They're finding emails that are kind of hard to find for journalists. Coordinator, you're usually more hands-on. A coordinator and a junior kind of executive, you're usually doing all the pitching. You're starting to pitch, and you're doing more of, like, the active outreach. That's when you're starting to be more, like, vocal during client calls. You're sitting in on the client meetings. Account executive, you're sometimes leading client calls or you are doing all the strategies and you're just sending it to the senior account executive or the supervisor to proofread. Usually there's an overlap with account executive and senior account executive. I think sometimes a lot of agencies structure that so it can determine uh, pay level. Supervisor slash manager, the roles are pretty much very similar. There's some pitching involved, but you're mostly just overseeing an account and making sure that the strategy is in place, but you're also the main point of contact for the client. The client is looking to you 
for PR advice and what is best for them from a PR mm-hmm. standpoint. I'm a senior account executive, so I'm like managing my own accounts, but I still have to report to my managing director. I don't have anyone that works underneath me, so it's just me doing everything. But yeah, traditionally I would have, you know, my assistants and my coordinators kind of doing all the like grunt work, Mm -hmm. and then I would be doing all the pitching. But it's a small agency, and things work a little bit differently with what we're doing, and a lot of my time is spent pitching rather than doing all the admin stuff that my assistants would be doing anyways. So it's, you know, it's fun. I like it. And then I report to my managing director who's just making sure everything's kind of in place. So that after the manager, even though I'm an SAE, I'm kind of doing like a manager supervisor role. My managing director, she is just overseeing things from a super, super high level and just making sure the clients are happy, Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, that's yeah. already a job. Yeah, uh-huh. that's already a job. And, like, even though, like, I'm their main point of contact, they still look at Jessica as, like, the head honcho. She's making sure that everything is put together and happening as it should. Okay. And they're getting enough press. And then the CEO should just be doing new business. And usually the managing director are also doing new business and making sure that the agency is running properly and there's money coming in. So both of them are in charge of getting new clients? Yes. Okay. And then in my job, my job is just unique because, again, like, there's not many of us, and I want to learn the new business side of things. So I offered to take on doing new business outreach. What's your strategy for trying to get new business? So a lot of it is looking for companies that are under the radar but are up and coming. So that's the Mm. first thing. I look and see, like, what is trending in the news? What is the hot topic? for millennial women or Gen Z men and women. A trend that we've actually been noticing that a lot of people are writing about is fertility. Egg freezing, when's the best time to get pregnant? Because a lot of people, a lot of millennial women are in their 30s now and they're wanting to have kids. Or they aren't ready to have kids and they want to freeze their eggs. So from an agent PR agency, we think, like what better industry to get into than the fertility industry? So we look for clients in the fertility industry that might be buzzy or might have, you know, good media legs or good media hook. And we think about the different ways that we can do PR for them. How can we make their CEO an expert on fertility? Like what are different thought leadership angles that we can work with? That's one umbrella. The product itself, because it's a product, like one company that we reached out to is a thermometer that you can take your temperature and it tells you if you're ovulating or if your body is ready to get pregnant. Yeah. It's basically two verticals of PR that we can work with that can be really successful. And then it's just the company itself. Like, why did the CEO choose to start this business? Mm-hmm. Like, what's his story? How can we do PR for him or even his leadership? If he has a female marketing coordinator, so like, how can we capitalize on that and get her in the news? How do you convince them to choose you above any other PR agency? Charisma. (laughs) Yeah, clicking. It's charisma. It's making them like you. Honestly, it is. Like, I mean, it's, I hate saying this. It's obviously proving to them and showing them, like, our former clients and being like, okay, this is who we used to work with. This is our experience. These are the contacts that we have. This is the amount of press we've gotten for all of these clients. This is what we can do for you. We give them creative ideas of how they can market their product better different events that they can host like partnerships that they can you know move forward with or that we can coordinate creative ideas and different partnerships is definitely a way to woo a potential client ultimately it's the chemistry like if you don't have chemistry with a brand then you're just not going to work well together even if it's like a big like big awesome company that you want to work with no matter what, if you don't have that chemistry or that connection, yeah. they're not going to hire you. You mentioned all these like different strategies for helping a company out because you mostly do brand, mm-hmm. like uh, throwing parties and yeah. promoting like top figures mm-hmm. in the company and getting news articles written. Yeah. What else is there? Those are the big things for Those PR. Are Those are the big three. Yeah, that's pretty much like what we do. A lot of times too, there's other ways that PR agencies come in, whether it's contributing to like marketing mm-hmm. ideas and like collaborating with their in-house marketing teams and coming up with creative ways to market a product, 
we get pulled in for that sometimes. But other than that, it's, it's pretty much it. I guess what... Do you think there's ideal ratio or do you find anything more effective? I always wonder like how effective an actual physical party is, even though it's very fun to get oh, to. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, I think media especially, when we're looking at media, they love to drink. <laughs> they love an excuse to drink and eat for free. And I think it does go a long way. And it helps, you know, it helps create that relationship with them so that you're constantly being written about. So from a media standpoint, it helps. And I think... From a consumer standpoint, I think it also helps because it also helps build a relationship. So those are beneficial for, you know, movies trying to get nominated for awards. I know for a fact that when we are doing PR campaigns, like when I first started my career, I was working at a PR agency that did film campaigns. You know, getting a movie nominated or trying to get a movie nominated for an Oscar, Golden Globe, SAG, PGA, you know, WGA, Directors Guild, whatever yeah. award. Yeah. Like we, that agency was solely in charge of getting movies nominated. And, you know, parties really made a difference there because it made the voters feel special. They're like, oh, oh. like I was invited to this party with the talent. This is great. Oh, there was a Q&A. Oh my God, now I know all about their method of why this worked. I was wondering, is it like the entertainment industry where, like, from level to level in PR, there's, like, this huge salary jump at one point? Sales is like this, too. Yes. I will say it's pretty stagnant until you make managing director or manager. And I think the reason why is because you have more of a say. I mean, like, I think it also just comes with experience. You learn that it's mm -hmm. okay to ask for more money. And it's okay to, like, yeah. be like, I want a six-figure salary. I'm bringing in business. I'm doing all these things. So then that's kind of like when it starts, you start to see a jump is usually when it's like manager and above. How long does that take someone usually from like graduating? Mm, it depends, but it could be anywhere. For some people, it's like really fast. It's like five years. Wow, really? Yeah. Or some people, it's 10. It just depends. Do you have any advice for people who want to get into PR? Like what's a good route to get in? A good route to get into PR. Intern. I highly recommend you interning in college interning when you're abroad intern in a PR agency no matter what because that is where you're going to learn the nitty-gritty and when you have an internship you learn the basics and you have a good baseline of like the admin day to day and then you're in the environment and you're seeing how people are interacting I know that's a very basic answer but internships really do make a huge difference and it's something I wish I wish I had more internships in college the one my senior year was the one where I learned the base skills, and I wish I had learned them earlier. What if you're, you missed the boat, you're changing You missed the boat. Well? Honestly, it's like, I know people that have done that, and you have to market the skills that you have. So to be successful in PR, you have to be a good writer. So say you're in marketing, like you can easily make the jump from marketing to PR because you understand from marketing, like you understand the sales point of view. And a lot of PR agencies find that attractive. They're like, oh, they get it from the, the client side. Like we want, because clients always get marketing and PR confused. So yeah. if we can bring that marketing mind into PR, we always see that as a huge like up, mm -hmm. like value for us. So that's one example. And then if you want to get into PR, it's honestly just networking. I know that's yeah. another very basic answer, but it really yeah. is all who you know. Why is it so hard? Because there's no like set skills. There's it's no set skills. It's writing and charisma. It's not like you're like an engineer and like you have this whole thing. It really is all who you know, and it's your experience and the way that you market your experience and bring it in to the PR world. It's like if you can finesse your way from one career path into a different career path, then great. Like I love this. This is awesome. But like. Just know, like, you're going to have to start lower if you want to move into PR. Because, like, you have to learn, like, the basic skills of yeah. that world. So what's your dream job? My dream job would be to be the VP of communications for a company like Patagonia. Or not even just Patagonia, but just any company that has an ethos that I personally align with. Someone who, our company that is sustainable and that is trying to actually make a true difference in this world whether it's for their mission, the money they're donating, whatever, 
I don't want to work for people to make them more money because they already have enough. You know, it's like mm-hmm. at a certain point, it's like my morals kick in and I'm just like, what? That's my dream is to be in-house. Why? I'm sick of working for multiple people. I'd rather work for just one. Are there niche PR agencies like we want to do environmental brands or mm-hmm. health brands? Mm-hmm. Nonprofits, medical, tech. There's a lot of niche agencies. Mm-hmm. There's the big guys like Fleischman Hillard, you know, Edelman, Ketchum. Those are the huge, huge ones that are international. But there's tons of niche, small, very small agencies that only do business to business PR or tech or plastic surgeons or health and wellness. Like it's, it varies. Yeah, it's interesting. Yours is such a diverse mix. Yes. Yeah. yeah. A lot of agencies are diverse, but I will say most try to stick in their realm of things yeah. and they're experts on that. So, yeah. With your uh, current expertise, do you have any PR advice for my podcast? Yes. <laughs> my biggest piece of advice is to be okay with failing, be okay with not being perfect. Because I think we as publicists and PR people, like we are constantly worried about not being perfect. We're worried about clients hating us. We're worried about clients firing us. It's business. It's okay. Just do your job and do it well. Ignore the noise because you're the only one standing in your way. And I think a lot of us tend to forget that. What are your biggest mistakes or failures along the way? I cared too much about what people thought of me. I was scared about every fucking thing. Just don't be scared. Just be fearless. And I promise you, you will regret being cautious more than you will taking that risk. Yeah. So take the risk. Another thing that was a huge mistake of mine, and this is more tactical, I was taking a company public, and the CEO that I was representing his company, um, he, you know, went to jail for tax evasion. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, but this was, like, years ago. This was years prior. But, like, everyone knew he went, he's, he'd been in jail. Like, everyone knew. It was a common knowledge. He talked about it in the media. Everyone knows he was in jail. And they were going public. You know, this newspaper, I should have known. It was the New York Post. I should have known they were going to be stupid about their fucking Mm. interview. But they wanted to interview Andy because they knew that he, at the time, was taking his company public. And they wanted to ask him questions about it. And they were like, oh, we would love to interview him and, like, write about the company Mm -hmm. being live on the stock market, on the stock exchange. And, you know, I was like, okay, we should do it. And so Andy was like, yeah, let's fucking do it. It's New York Post, whatever, who cares? Like, what are they going to ask? The worst they can ask is, why did you go to jail? And that's (laughs) what they asked. And they kept asking very, like, specific questions. And it was, like, kind of shitty questions they were asking. And Andy, afterwards, like, he answered them very well because he always does. But he was pissed. He was so mad at me for, like, making him do that interview. And then he called my boss. My boss got mad at me. And then I started crying And then it was just, like, a snowball effect of, like, me being upset and me being so caught up in it and being emotional about it. And I know it's hard not to be emotional, but my biggest mistake from that situation was not thinking about the full picture, being like, okay, this is the New York Post. They're going to write a salacious story about the CEO who was in jail and how, like, why the SEC... Securities Exchange People Commission should be concerned about him going public as a company. You know, it's like he was uh, he went to jail. Like, why are we letting him go public? And that was like the basis of their article. And it was like, well, shouldn't even have participated. But at the same time, it's like, wouldn't you have rather participated in that than not? I don't know. I saw both ways. But that was my biggest mistake was just not seeing it full picture and presenting it to Andy as it was. I got really excited and I was like, oh, it's the New York Post, more press. You just did CNBC. You just did Wall Street Journal. You just did all these amazing things that I got you. Like, let's just do New York Post and say, fuck it. That's how I thought. And I shouldn't have thought like that. I should have thought more strategic. And I should have slowed down and I was going too fast. And then he got mad. If you had to redo it, what would you have done? With your now, I would have told him I would have been like Andy. New York Post wants to interview you. 
here's what could go wrong. Mm. And I would have said it like that rather than being like, you need to do this interview. It's like I got so emotional with it. And I think that was something that really I could have done differently. And I look back and it's like every mistake that I made and every like hardship that I had in my career, it's like I was way too emotional about it. And it's like you, again, like I, again, I said this earlier, it's like when you separate emotion from your job, you are so much less stressed about life and everything. It just becomes easier. Just yeah. separate the emotion. It's easier said than done, but. Yeah. What do you think is the best thing you did for your career? The best thing I ever did for my career was move to Los Angeles. Like, if you really want to be in PR, like, you can do it mostly anywhere, but if you really want to be big, I mean, this is very specific. Like, I come from a background where, like, my family was, like, very supportive of me, and if I were to fail, they would take me in. And if I were to run out of money, they would also take me in. So, just know that, Mm -hmm. but... Had I not moved to L.A., I would not be where I was today. Or if I moved to New York, like Chicago, Atlanta, L.A., New York. Best cities to pursue a huge PR dream. I would never expect that. Atlanta's a huge city. It's yeah. a huge city. And it has a lot of industry. It has a lot of entertainment. It has a lot of mm, food and right. beverage. A lot of really big brands like Home Depot is based there. Randomly, it has huge companies based there. So it's big. It's big on PR. I reached the end. Yeah. So you know I like to give my guests like a couple minutes to pitch anything they want. Anything you want to self-pitch? If anyone needs PR services that is listening out there. (laughs) (laughs) I am a great publicist and I will bring your brand into the new year with great press. Come to me. I'm at Tyler Barnett PR. We're a great agency. How can they contact you? They can contact us at info at tylerbarnettpr.com. And Barnett is B A R N E T T P R dot com. Perfect. Tyler Barnett PR dot com. Hey guys, hope you enjoyed our interview with the charismatic and hilarious Emily Johnston. I loved how vulnerable she was about the ups and downs of her career. And I found some of her stories like getting yelled at by her boss about something she wasn't even sure was a mistake to be refreshingly honest because most people don't normally open up about something like that. You can find links to anything mentioned in the episode in our show notes at thenewschoolpodcast.com slash episodes. Stick around till the end to hear a sneak peek of next week's episode. To stay up to date on content, make sure to follow us on Instagram at the New School Podcast and on Twitter at the New School Pod. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, you could find your review on a future The New School episode. Do you feel like you or someone else would be an amazing guest on our show? If yes, please contact us on our website, thenewschoolpodcast.com slash contact. Want your ultimate guide on how to turn your passions into a meaningful career? Subscribe to our weekly newsletter at thenewschoolpodcast.com. The New School with Christine Hong is produced by Jenny Snyder and Shristi Biani. Editing by Sydney Salk, John Simpson, and Joseph Cho. Video editing by Josh Stanley. Special thanks to our marketing team who helped us spread our mission and put the New School name out there. Katie Osaki, Emma Borgerding, Giovanni Cortez, Cynthia Shao, Dina Che, and Marissa Wolfsheimer. Next week, look out for Jeff Maker. He's been working as a touring lighting designer for concerts the past 14 years and has worked with some big groups like Good Charlotte, All Time Low, Dropkick Murphys, My My Boston's, Yellow Card, Boys Like Girls, and Click Five. He's been nominated for one of the top honors in the touring industry, the Lighting Designer of the Year at the Parnelli Awards. Live concerts, just to see the audience react to something that you did along with the artists that they paid to see. You don't want to make them feel awkward with a blind spot in their eyes for like two songs. You know, you could be mindful of that, but anything can go wrong. Everything can go right. You're there in the moment with the people that are there to see the artist. When you see an audience look at what you worked hard on with an artist and then they're enjoying it as much as you are, it's just very satisfying. If I see a good show and I feel like I did a good job, I'm like, okay, uh, okay, I can still do this then. I'm going to keep doing this. And every time you do something, I feel like you fall more and more in love with the job. So I've been doing it for 14 years now. So I, I still fall in love with it every day I do it.
Come back next Monday to find out from Jeff how he started his career in lighting design, what's it like to be doing lights live for concerts for huge bands like Good Charlotte, and advice he has for other aspiring lighting designers. All right, guys, have a great day. Try something new today.